Since Randall's puberty, an illness had infected his mind. Vivid dreams racked his sleep, not ordinary smoky, unstable ramblings most dreamers have, nor those constructed from random pieces spewed up from the raw mind, but tangible, uniform events. Amazingly clear and distinctly uncluttered dreams oppressed his slumber. Perhaps average people encounter such vividness once every two full moons and relish the intensity, yet for Randall such recurrences night after night diseased his mind. In his early years, the conscious and unconscious worlds blurred or collided. He confused reality with indistinguishable but false dreamscapes. He distrusted everything he perceived. Dreams burdened him, or rather their reality disturbed him. As soon as sleep fell upon him, graphic scenes filled his head. His dreams had all the necessary ingredients for drama, tragedy, and comedy. Later in his adolescence, Randall learned that it was best not to fight the alternative realities that composed his nightly imaginings. Indeed, they became a force to respect. Rather, he learned how to distinguish dreams from waking reality by the continuity of ordinary reality. As his dreams ended at dawn, never to repeat, Randall learned ordinary reality maintained a constancy that dreaming did not. Unfortunately, upon reaching the age of 19, that conviction crashed, and Randall turned to McLeish's best for his nightly opiate. After his 19th birthday, Randall awoke from his usual menu of alternative reality, in this case a dream in which a robed figure spoke to him in a desert ocean of sand. He went to work with his father in their seaside furniture shop, and at the end of the day he returned home, ate and prepared for early bed. Before dropping off, he looked around and fixed the picture in his mind with the aim to recognize the familiar scene in the morning. However, upon falling asleep the second night, Randall encountered the same figure from the previous night. The dream had continued. The place, the time, person, and events had not changed with the previous day's dawning. Each night thereafter, for an entire month, Randall dreamed one long interconnected story in nightly sequences. While Randall had regularly spoken of his visions with his family, he did not reveal this dream for Randall began to fear that his condition worsened. He wondered how long he would remain connected to a rational world, thus talking about his oncoming insanity provided no comfort. The dream made no sense. A strange man dressed in a series of short robes approached him. Both he and the robed figure were in a singular desert upon a charred mesa overlooking shifting sands like oceans moving in their currents. Behind was a canyon, which cradled an amphitheater of uneven, pinnacled rocks, columns that spread across a blackened depression. Haze obscured the figure. Although the voice was pleasant, Randall could not understand it. Yet, when Randall spoke, the character understood. All night the shrouded figure talked to Randall. At times it would raise a finger in anger, pace profusely or laugh with a throated beautiful sound. The oddity's pathos flowed directly into Randall's blood and brain, and when the speaker wept in his anonymous words, Randall moaned. Likewise, when the personages proclaimed victory or triumph, Randall cheered. During the succeeding days without sleep, Randall grew unwell and irritable. He cut off all social contacts until finally the dream of the robed figure ended. Yet Randall's depression continued. He lost weight and gained moodiness. Pan, his father, observing his son's odd behavior, squeezed the cause out of him. The singular, tormentous dream had upturned Randall's life. His family, too, had begun to question his sanity. With Randall's confession, the family agreed that Randall should temporarily leave the shop on the pretense of visiting relatives, but in fact isolate himself to quarantine his troubles. They suggested seclusion on a small island, part of the Seawall Islands, where their extended family owned a cottage. Indeed, Randall had often ventured to the camp as a teenager. He could feed himself there by fishing and scavenging. To ease his sleep, he purchased a packet of McLeish's Best upon the advice of a friend, which did help his apprehension. 
Even better, the drug's opioid, apathy-inducing effects fractured his dreams. He was about to embark on his solo retreat when a unique episode rerouted him to his current journey through the Tizri Pass. The evening before his planned extended leave, a sailor of unknown rank dropped into the family shop to purchase an incense table for his ship's captain. The traveler's lively discussion included an adventure in which he described a phenomenon that occurred in the balm every five years when dreams and reality merge. He called it the Two Nights of the Balm. The customer himself had never witnessed the two nights, much less ever been to the balm, for he was a seaman, a merchant carrier of goods who never left the water. The story he told belonged to someone else, but he said he had proof. While his ship was in port in Shattered Bots, one of the northernmost harbor towns, the seaman met a grizzled near giant of a man who spoke of the magical nights. He had shown everyone his small cache of bloodstone which he was selling, and which evidenced his presence in the balm, the sole source of the mineral. The seaman explained his tale. He told me every five years before the sun can rise in the eastern sky, the second night pushes out the day. Thus, two nights emerged. During what would have been the normal day, the stars die and blackness fills the heavens. However, the real wizardry is that one's dreams and reality consolidate. Any man standing in the balm on such event would thereafter have power and understanding to control his own dreams and the dreams of others. Pan and Randall stood silent. Powers to make dreams alive, the sailor roared. How did your giant friend support his theory? asked Pan, the skeptic. Not a giant, half a giant, the sailor protested at the interruption. And he was not my friend either. Yes, but why would you put any truth in that irregular fellow, countered Randall. Oh, it was that night in the tavern that he promised to visit each one of us while we slept. It were no ordinary promise, by trickery, like that which I'd make, then come and wake you up and thus fulfill my bargain. Nah, no, it weren't that. He said he'd come in our dreams, while we slept, and our very own beds locked tight in our rooms. And did he? Father pressed. And did he ever? Answered the storyteller. Here I was bunking with my cruise mate, and into my dreams he jumped like a bloody nightmare. I couldn't say a word. He had me by the throat, and said, Did I believe him now? I shook myself to waken, but couldn't. I thought it was the most powerful dream I had had in a great age, and the more I tried to disbelieve, the more the man laughed at me. He let go and sat down on something, and I couldn't take my eyes off the fella. True to his words, he was there in my dreams. His skin looked like bronze or copper, and he was dressed in the feathers of a raven. Suddenly he disappeared, and I jumped up in my own bed with sweat rolling down to here the man said, pointing to the middle of his chest. And about that time, my bunkmate, who also had heard the boasting of this villainous man, screamed at the top of his bloody lungs and did the same as I. That is, he was up out of his bed, sweating like myself. We both knew, as sure as I'm standing, we each had met the strange traveler as he had spoken. The storyteller stopped and waited for their reactions. Pan did not believe, but Randall did. Should the two knights instill certain powers that affected one's dreams, perhaps with him, such forces would empower him to regulate his nighttime encounters, or, even better, the strength to shut off his dreams, which overran him like flood tides. The sailor had his purchase and bid farewell to the two shopkeepers, but his story of the two knights never left Randall. That night, Randall self-medicated with his chosen narcotic to avoid sleep. In his solitary deliberations, a gnawing suggestion framed the narrative. While he debated the story's veracity, he should indeed visit the two knights if it existed. By early morning, less than a day after the sailor's chance visit, Randall had pledged himself to undergo the complications and inconvenience of an excursion into the balm. Yet time was of the essence, for as the sailor departed, he mentioned that the balm would soon be visited by the strange phenomenon. Thus, go now, or wait five years. He figured the time, and if he did not delay, he could arrive in the balm within three weeks ahead of the two nights.